we have to move from one colleague to the other. We're telling you this story filed by Komla Adum. Now, visual impairment is a major source of uh, morbidity in the world. We're close to 300 million people living with one form or the other. Mm. And so far, we're told that about 80 to over 90 percent of this number, however, are people living in low income and in communities in developing countries such as Ghana. Mm. In the second part of uh, his special feature from village nicknamed Disabled Land, uh, Komla Adum uh, reports that over 50 inhabitants in the community are suffering visual impairment deformities with some more completely blind and already we're told medical experts are believing those whose conditions are not hopeless as yet uh, have uh, some remedies where they can have their conditions managed and the gentleman is here but um, uh, good morning to you good morning. and we'll be playing your thing shortly and uh, how did you come to dream about such a story in a community? Okay, so this was a, I was there one day when a friend of mine called me. He works with an NGO, and the NGO is a charity arm of a church located in Medina. So they told me that they were embarking on an outreach to the Upper West region. And then they were going to donate items to some visually impaired communities living in that part of the Upper West region. So I was intrigued okay, what, what do they mean by visually impaired community? And they told me that there are quite a number of people living there who are visually impaired. As in the entire community? Not entire community, but a section of them. Okay. What it is is that the community has a population of about 5,000, but out of this number, about 400 of them are living with one form of physical challenge or the other. Okay. And then 50 of them are suffering visual impairment. Wow. From but, the community? Yes. But these numbers are just the official numbers, those who have come out to register that they are living with one form of disability or the other. According to opinion leaders, there could be more people mm. who are hiding in the community who are having one form of visual impairment or physical challenge or the other. So okay. that's how I came by this story. I decided to follow them to the Upper West region during mm. Christmas. Okay. Oh, okay. So you're just like the Accra boy, Maxwell Agbagba, that we put in Kumasi. This time you were put in the Upper West region. That's correct. Okay, okay. let's watch a story. The intriguing story about these people here in Kani is one which is laced with a lot of mystery. As we take the dusty road that leads to the village, I notice the scant presence of human existence. Eight years ago, 28-year-old Hamza lost his sight after he was hit by a football one afternoon. He recounts how that incident has left him permanently visually impaired. I wasn't born like this. What happened to you? Yes. I think I, I, it was one day around 5 o'clock I was at home. Then we went to play football. Sometimes you need to exercise yourself. Then we just moved when I was in the distance on the field playing. I crashed with a friend and then the ball hit my eyes. Mm. And that is where this uh, problem came in. And when I moved to the I went to the distance, visited the hospital, I think the specialist told me that that I, I, the, 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 there's, there has been something like this in a glaucoma in my, this in, in my side before. Mm. And that is where the problem, so when I received this, uh, the excessive uh, just a pressure on the eyes, then it gets to the in and then this uh, visual impairment came in. That, that will help me to have some small sight for some time. So now I can see you, but I can't identify you. That is the only thing. Married with an eight-year-old son, Hamza is in his second year at the University of Education. But there is no void created in the garden. His wife manages his portion of a garden in his absence. He's been able to cater for his family with the small revenue generated from vegetable sale. I've been a farmer and a student as well until I had this problem. So anytime at all I return from school, I try to uh, work on uh, the land, like to plow the land to cultivate some crops so that 
I will have, after cultivating it, I think it is the, this is the weeding that matters a lot. When I weed it with my wife, I will travel back to the school, then leave the other thing for him. And by his grace, I think things are always in order. If I even get a bag of corn, or even, uh, what is it, some, uh, let me say, uh, half bag of corn and a half, uh, this is a half bag of beans, but uh, I think, uh, the two of us with the, the small child, you know, sometimes it helps to some extent. However, his condition is making education a pain, especially with the kind of treatment he receives from people. Hamza, very vocal, tells of his tertiary education struggles. Whenever I start my journey, the prayer is a few, God knows best. And I, from Ghana here, I moved to Wa. When I move to Wa, I will just, I will alight at this in the PDT and I will ask someone to tell me to the, 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 the North Station. Then I will pick another person, I will bother another means to Kumasi. Okay. And from Kumasi, there is no straight means from Wa to Winneba. When I get to Kumasi, then I will get another means to Makassim. The moment I alight, I have to look for a taxi, charter a taxi. If not 150, but 20 cities. Uh, but how easy or difficult has it been for you all these years? It has been difficult sometimes because the uh, financial problem and I mean a great burdens or may I say barriers sometimes. Okay. If I don't have the money to afford the taxi, I have to move to the lower side, this the, 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 the road side, and then probably be there and continue to stop me until I get somebody that will help me to that place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sometimes some people see it necessary that with their condition, they must, what is it, assist you. An area of urgent help the people of Kani require is undoubtedly the establishment of an eye clinic and the improvement of general health care here. Madame Elizabeth is a medical assistant at a health facility in the community. She tells me the facility does not have an eye center to cater for the needs of the over 50 persons who live with one form of eye defect or another. We don't have um, eye uh, clinic here. Okay. And with the health insurance, we only take care of uh, congenitivitis, maybe the people with the uh, discharges. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But if we see that uh, the condition needs uh, much attention. We refer the person to Jiramba. They have an eye clinic where they can check them. She also laments further healthcare challenges the community faces. The space is a problem. Uh -huh. The space is a problem. Like if you will get uh, maybe about two people that you want to detain and observe, you can't do it okay. because it's only one bed. Okay. Uh -huh. So the, the space is one and then also when the space is provided then it has to be beds to... If the, the space is provided, maybe, and we get the beds to about two, we can add it to the one. And you know, the other one self, the way it is very low. Some of us bending down, you have to sit. Uh -huh. Or you call for assistance. Some watchers have blamed the absence of an eye clinic in the community for the worsening situation where many more people are getting visually impaired with each passing month. This position is rightly corroborated by assembly member of the area, Mr. Kabiri Luanga, who is of a view some of the visual impairments could have been avoided with prompt medical attention. Eye is very delicate. Maybe, but if you have a problem with your eye, instead of you going to the clinic, because you don't have, somebody will tell you go into the bush and get some other things for you to use. You know? So by the end of the day, your poverty will send you to that place. However, resident in ophthalmology at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Vera Boyo, gives an indication of the severity of a matter and how many of us are exposed to some of these conditions inadvertently. Visual impairment or blindness is a major source of morbidity in our world with about close to 300 million visually impaired worldwide 
unfortunately 90% of these visually impaired live in developing countries or low income um, areas. There are several causes. Commonists in our part of the world is cataracts. Now the eye is a very specialized organ um, which transmits light waves from images through various mediums to the optic nerve which interprets these images and that's what helps us to see. Now if there's any defect in any of these mediums, so the anterior part of the eye, um, the glassy parts that we see that is supposed to be transparent, we have the cornea. Behind that is what we call the lens. If you have any defects in this or the back of the eye, which is the retina or the nerve itself, then you will have, you'll be visually impaired or go blind. With cataracts, you have clouding or whitening of the lens and the lens is in between. It helps um, bend the light waves onto the back of the eye, which um, goes to the optic nerve, which is supposed to interpret the images for you. So if you have this whitening of the lens, it means that images cannot be transmitted and you can't see the images properly. And cataract is very common in our part of the, of the world. Then we also have glaucoma, which is also not very common, but it's present and it's a prevent, even though it cannot be cured, it can be treated. Then we have other causes like um, complications of diabetes. Now we are seeing a lot of cases of diabetes emerging in our parts of the world, even though previously it was thought to be more common in the Western world. But diabetes is creeping up in our society and you can have complications in the eye from diabetes. One study estimates that measles causes up to 60,000 cases of blindness a year globally, with poor access to measles vaccination and malnutrition often correlating with high rates of blindness in the most affected countries, including Africa. It is believed that some of the conditions among residents here could have resulted from measles and other chronic diseases. To salvage what is left of the Kani community at this point, Dr. Boyo prescribes regular medical outreaches. We also have problems with the anterior muscle, the glassy part I, I mentioned earlier, which is the cornea. If you have um, anything that causes whitening of that aspect as well, then you can have blindness. So infections, injuries, um, if you have any um, immune conditions can all cause opacities or whitening of the cornea. Then we also have the infectious causes such as um, trachoma and then we have oncocercasis. The incidence and prevalence of these two have reduced but they are still within our communities. Oh, trachoma is more related to um, sanitation, so house flies, carrying the organism and transmitting. And then with, in the case of oncocercasis, it's acquired once an individual is bitten by um, a fly known as a simoleon black fly. And these flies harbor some parasites known as the oncocerca volvulus. Now when they bite an individual, it gets into the bloodstream, causes some reactions that affects, and these reactions occur in different parts of the body, including the eye. 80% of visual impairment cases are treatable or curable or even preventable. Unfortunately, in low-income settings, a lot of people are walking around with preventable causes of blindness. For example, if you have a cataract, it can easily be removed and then an artificial lens put in to give you a 6-6 six -six vision, that's perfect vision. Okay. If you have glaucoma, if you're diagnosed with glaucoma, in the case of glaucoma, it's actually um, called the silent thief of sight because it hardly gives any symptoms. Okay. But gradually you have your optic nerve being destroyed. 
despite Ghana having about 100 ophthalmologists catering for the needs of the population of over 26 million, Dr. Beryu suggests it is possible to carry out eye screening outreaches to very deprived communities such as Kani. On the issue of a black flies, Dr. Beryu advocates there should be intermittent spraying of affected communities. Currently there are some programs going ongoing within the country. Um, it's treated using ivermectin, which helps, it kills the larvae that the parasite produces. So it's done intermittently, I think 6 to 12 monthly. And this helps reduce the parasite's load. Then there should also, if that is already not happening, and if it's been confirmed that it's onchocerciasis, there should be intermittent spraying um, of the flies. That also helps to prevent the spread of the infection. As I said, there are some programs ongoing that are already happening. I don't know if this community is part of those programs, but if it is really onchocerciasis, then I'm sure um, they should be part of it. While she believes all hope is not lost for some of the affected residents here, the earlier something drastic is done about the plight of the people, the better. Once the screening is done and specific causes of the eye defects and impairments are identified, some measures could be put in place to slow down the pace at which the disease progresses. Okay. Another thing that will help in our communities, because there aren't a lot of eye clinics around with specialists, Currently, we have um, about 100 or less of pharmacologists for a population of 26 million, and they are not evenly distributed in all the regions. So one thing that will help in our communities will be um, intermittent or frequent outreaches to do eye screening for people in deprived areas. And that's something that we may need to look, look at and um, sort out. Because that's what, for most people, it may be difficult to get access to an eye, an eye clinic where they can have um, the opportunity to check their eye pressures, have their optic nerve examined. Okay. In the case of glaucoma, if it's caught early, or even um, when it's moderate, you can put in measures to slow down the pace at which the disease progresses. Okay. And so no, not all, all hope is not lost okay. when the once the screening is done. Even if um, it's a bit advanced, you can still put in measures, give eye drops to lower the pressure. Sometimes some surgeries can be done to also help reduce the pressure within the eye. And all this will help to maintain the little function of the nerve that is left. So in some cases, all hope may be lost if the disease is far advanced and very little can be done. But in a lot of cases, there might be something that can be done to preserve the function of the But eye. beyond the absence of an eye clinic is a bigger concern. Many of the residents resort to traditional means of treating eye defects and other health conditions, which assembly member of the area has been working hard to change. Komla Adun, Kani, Upper West Region. So we're back in the studio, and it's all because of you. Now, you went there with the NGO. Yes. So what was the response of the NGO to some of these um, problems, the, especially the side problems that were plaguing the members of the community? Okay, what the NGO has been doing for the past year is that they've been trying to mobilize resources from civil society groups, NGOs, and other well-meaning Ghanaians. And then they go there every quarter to go and donate to these mm -hmm. people. So they told me when we left the community that they were going to return to the place in April where they will be going along with medical people to carry out eye screening and okay. other health outreaches to the people yeah. of the community and also supply some books and other items to the children in that community. But this is a community that doesn't even have an eye clinic. It doesn't have an eye clinic. Wow. So they have to literally travel over three miles to Jirapa where they have to go and assess um, eye care. And for these people who cannot even see, I wonder how they are going to be able to. But it's also significant uh, to note the, the one gentleman that you spoke with who is blind, uh, who is a second year st student, 
at the at the university of education yes how how does he manage it because well, he also has a child and he has a wife yes so uh, as i mentioned earlier these people have a garden where each visually impaired person or physically challenged person has like a plot in that garden where they grow vegetables so he for example has a plot in the garden but because he's schooling his wife and his child work on his plot in the garden so they grow the vegetables the cabbages the onions and all those other things so that's where they generate some revenue mm. to support themselves as a family and he was telling me in the in the story also that accessing disability funds from the district assembly has been very very difficult because they keep tossing them go and come back today go come go come yeah. so it's been hard for them but they've been trying with the support of the ngo they give him a bicycle they give them some um, he's able to ride even though his wife he's does. Blind? His wife does. Okay. So what it is is that many of the people, or many of the spouses, I should say, one of them has the challenge, the other one doesn't. So okay. the other complements the other. Wow. So one person, he for example is visually impaired, but his wife is fit. So his wife is the one who does all the errands, okay. all the running around. Amazing. Like that, yeah. This is an incredible story. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. And to think they are not sitting down and then begging for arms yeah. and are putting themselves to use. That's that's what touched me about this story and I decided But who is there to, to go and beg arms from? That's, uh, yeah. Who can but what, what are you hoping, you know, what are you hoping that in telling the story this would achieve? Well, I, I already people have reached out to us since the story, what the part one of the story aired yesterday, some people on social media reached out to us, some doctors and health workers at Kolibu, they want to voluntarily go there, organize medical outreach years. Fantastic. I've had people call me that they want to donate books to their children, okay. for example. So we want some of these donations to come in to support these hardworking people. And in the part one of the documentary I did, the, the garden that they are also working on has a broken fence. So mm -hmm. rampaging cattle go in there to destroy the crops. Okay. So they need the fencing to be done for them. Okay. And they also need irrigation. Mm -hmm. The canals that connect a dam in the area to the garden has broken up, so water doesn't flow okay. to the place. Wow. So they also need it. So that's where Amazing. one district, one dam comes. <laughs> up. That's where it becomes handy, I think, Roland. <laughs> I guess we have to build the first dam in this particular community. Well, there's a dam yeah. there, but it's just drying up. Okay. Because at the time we went there, it was hammer time, so mm. yeah, it was drying up. Okay. Well, but this is an incredible story. It is. Uh, and you've done pretty well, so thank you for sharing you know, the story with all of us yes. and hopefully a lot more people will come forward and support. Right. I hope um, we can have the NGO on to come and also tell how hey, they got in, how they got in touch with these people because I don't know how they, they, are, they are located in Accra. Yeah. So they have to come and tell us how they got to know this. Why country. don't you tell their story for us? Mm. Tell their story for well, us. Well, I give you the link. <laughs> <laughs> no no but thank you so much. <laughs> right. Uh, and today it looks like we're letting our colleagues tell you the story that they've uncovered. <laughs>